Welcome back to another episode of the Outsider Sports Baseball Podcast. Just the two of us today, Corey Jason, John Pauline, no Ben, no Dylan. Life gets in the way sometimes, no big deal. So let's get right into it, John. John, did you see that Father's Day had MLB's highest total attendance for a single day since 2008? I mean, people are saying baseball's been dead and, you know, I'm one of those people, but that's kind of crazy that more people are coming to the park, especially on Father's Day, a holiday. It's a Sunday, I I guess, but that number might have been driven up, you know, Yankees, Red Sox, doubleheader. But still, that's that's an insane number to see that they had the best total attendance since 2008 for a single day. I'm actually surprised it's been that long, like 2008, since like they had the highest attendance. It just seems like so long, I guess. Baseball really did fall off. I mean, you always think of it, especially fathers, because you always think of it as like, you know, almost stereotypically, you know, you go to the game with your, you know, your father, you know, the baseball games with your dad, you know, you share the game experience and stuff. So I guess it's, you know, good to see, you know, people back in the seats again. I wonder if it's the new rule changes, you know, bringing people back in and interest in that, or if it's, you know, maybe the World Baseball Classic had some effect of like, you know, getting people hyped up for baseball again. Maybe it was just the games on the weekend. Yeah, there's a lot of different possibilities for this. I hope it's not the rule changes because that means they're working. And I really don't think that's to be the case. But let's let's go on to some other good stuff going. The Pirates, they called up their 2021 number one overall pick, Henry Davis. He's a catcher, but in his first game, he'll be batting seventh and playing right field. And John, what do you think about guys playing at a position, especially a rookie, in their first career start? I think if they're in the minors and they're in the minors playing different positions and they come up to the majors and they're playing different – like playing multiple positions, I think that's perfectly fine. But I think when, you know, you have a player who's in the minors and they're, you know, pretty set on playing one position and they haven't really, you know, branched out and played other positions and you bring them up to the minors and you start playing them in other positions, I think that's – a good way to to ruin a player because I think the Phillies did that with Scott Kingerly and I just did not work out but I think you know coming up you know young players come up play multiple positions definitely versatile and definitely you know you can get them in the lineup more if they play multiple positions adds more depth to the roster yeah it certainly does I'm a big proponent of positional uh, versatility I really think everybody on the roster that's not a pitcher should be able to play at least two positions because that's how you lengthen the lineup. That's how you keep guys healthy and fresh. Allow for more DH days because you have multiple people that can play multiple positions. You'll never get caught in a bad spot with an injury to a key position because there's always somebody else capable of taking that spot. So I think it's a good thing. He's been playing it in the minors. So I don't think it's that big a deal. I don't think they'll ruin him. But you, if you're going to have guys play multiple positions, you can't start that in the majors. You have to start that in the spring, in spring training. Let them come up in the minors like that. But let them learn. Don't make them go out there and throw them to the wolves right away. You know what I mean? Let them try to figure it out in the lower pressure situation. Work on their craft and then their secondary craft in the field as opposed to just throwing them out there in the majors saying, hey, you know, you've been a catcher all your life, but – Play some right field in a big league game. Just doesn't work like that. Now let's move on to something else. How about the San Francisco Giants sweeping the Dodgers and moving into second place in their division? I don't know what's with the Dodgers. Something's going on down in L.A. And, you know, seems like the Dodgers and Angels have kind of flipped because the Angels right now, they've won 11 of their last 15, and they're rolling. Otani, Trout. Everybody's just clicking right now. Otani leads the uh, the majors in home runs. So it just seems like the Dodgers and Angels have switched places. And San Fran now moving into second place. They're a team to look at going forward. Lance Lynn of the Chicago White Sox. He struck out 16 versus Seattle, tying a White Sox single game record. And that's the most in a single game for a pitcher in all of major in all of the majors this year. So, you know, kudos to him. I couldn't do that with the Yankees, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, 
that's a pretty solid Seattle lineup, especially with J Rod in there. And I just I'm so I'm kind of surprised, but good for him. Bryce Miller on the other on the other end pitched a gem. Lance Lynn actually lost that game five one that he struck out sixteen, if you can imagine. He gave up, I believe it was two runs in the third. That kind of gave him the loss. So imagine striking out 16, going out to pitch in the eighth, but you still lose the game. It's to me that's just ridiculous. That absolutely just stinks when you have such a good game like that, 16 strikeouts and still get the loss. It almost reminds me of like Aaron Nolan from the Phillies. He can have like 10, 11 strikeouts, walk like two guys, and then they give a home run up and lose the game. So, I mean, it happens sometimes and stuff. I mean, it feels good, it feels good to get the strikeouts, but, you know, it feels even better to get the, the W. Yeah, I mean, the offense kind of feels a little sucky after that, but they are they also think to themselves, you know, hey, you know, we did get the, the job done. So at the end of the day, that's what matters is the W in the win column. John, tell me if you saw this. Pete Alonzo came back in 11 days from his four- to six-week injury from getting hit by a pitch versus Charlie Morton in the Braves. Did you see that coming? He was supposed to be out till at least the All-Star break, it seemed, and now he's back and hitting. Full go, full throttle, no, nothing holding him back. That's that's pretty crazy. Honestly, I didn't see it coming at at all. It just, I mean, usually with those kind of things, especially getting hit by pitches, like that can be like a nagging injury for, um, on, like frankly, almost the rest of the season if you, you know, rush it back too quick. So I'm surprised he's coming back this early, but the Mets really need him. Like, they are missing him bad. So it's good. So I guess, you know, Mets fans can be happy that he's coming back. I'm sure Ben's very happy that he's coming back. So, you know, hopefully he, you know, hopefully he didn't lose his step while he was hurt. Yeah, hopefully. You never want to see somebody go down, and then when they come back, you want to make sure and see them at their peak performance, especially Alonzo, who was leading the league in home runs when he went down. But let's discuss something going down in St. Louis. David Freese, World Series playoff hero for the Cardinals rejected his spot in the Cardinals ring of honor in the Cardinals team hall of fame. Now he's famously a boy from St. Louis grew up a Cardinals fan. So this situation kind of perplexes me. Now I understand his reasoning behind it. He says he looks around, sees all the names that are already in the hall in the ring. And then also the ones that aren't in there yet. And he says he just doesn't feel like he belongs. But it just seems to me that there's an underlying issue. Maybe there was something going on in his personal life that we don't really know about or know too much about that was preventing him from really wanting to associate with that part. But, John, why do you think he would do something like this? I feel like it's kind of like a imposter syndrome thing. You know, he, he sees, you know, he sees all these other people you know, in their hall, you know, teams hall of fame and stuff. And it's just like, you know, I just don't think he feels like he belongs there, but the fans certainly do believe he belongs there. And I think he, you know, he belongs there. I mean, you're, you're, a, you know, you're a world series hero, you know, is he hit the, what do you hit? He you know, won the game with a walk off home run in the bottom of the 11th Cardinal, you know, and the Cardinals won game seven, like, you know, that's, I mean, that's, that's a, Hall of Fame worthy thing, I think, for teams. I mean, what more can you do to to prove that you deserve to be there? But I just, I just think you know he looks at everyone else who's in there, and I just don't think he feels like you know he should be in their company. Again, I get his thinking, I get his reasoning, but you're a playoff hero for your childhood team, winning a World Series in 2013. You don't have to have the regular season stats and accolades to deserve a spot. What you did in those few games in October, you deserve to take your place in the lore of the Cardinals franchise, one of the most storied franchises in all of Major League Baseball. You can't really be upset with him, but you could scratch your head at the thought. And maybe down the line, he will take his rightful place because I'm sure that's not something they'll rescind if in 10, 15, 20 years, he decides, you know, I'd like to actually get in there. I'm sure they'll let him without any vote because he did get voted in. So maybe he just feels like he's not far enough removed from the game also. He did retire in 2019. Last stint was with the Dodgers, and he didn't play all that well. Maybe he just needs more time between the game 
he just needs more time away. So I really think that's uh that's what's the uh, issue. He just needs time. Now I got a proposal for you, John. A trade proposal. I'm gonna give you five trades. Not gonna give you the full terms of the deal. Just player A going to team A, and tell me what you think. Let's start it off. The Chicago White Sox for the trade deadline should trade Tim Anderson to the Dodgers. How do you feel about that? Honestly, I mean, White Sox aren't playing too great this year, and I feel like, you know, that would help the Dodgers out quite a bit. So, I mean, I think I'm a fan of that trade. I think if, you know, if the White Sox had even, you know, just get it, you know, who's the other guy on their team? Uh, Luis, their one pitcher. Uh, Joe Alito, or if I pronounce his name, I think even maybe trading him might be a good idea too. Yeah, moving Giolito would be smart. I think the White Sox should tear it down, send Lou Bob over to the Yankees, the man left field. But the, the White Sox, I was not high on, if you guys remember, back when we were doing our preseason uh, talk about all the teams. I didn't think the White Sox were going to be really any type of good, and that's shown to be true. The next one is that the Reds trade Alexis Diaz to the Tampa Bay Rays. I'm interested to see what you think about a relief pitcher in a trade. Mm, I don't know about that one since, you know, Reds have Ellie De La Cruz coming up. You know, they're starting to do good right now. I mean, it, I guess it would really depend on that trade for me is just what what the Reds can get in return from the Rays, honestly. See, I don't think they should make this trade because I think the Reds might end up winning that division. It's a sorry, sorry division. The Pirates, for all the good they've done, they're still not a great team. The Brewers have been a shell of what they've been the last couple of years. The Reds are on an up and up with Ellie De La Cruz. The Cardinals, they're disappointing to say the least, even though they did take two out of three from the Mets. And the Cubs are just bad. So I think the, the Reds should maybe even look to be buyers at the deadline to see if they can sneak in and win this division. I know they're a little, they're an extended uh, amount of games out of, you know, first place. But, you know, a good second half, they can overcome a pretty sizable gap. And quite frankly, the gap that they're in now isn't something we haven't seen before. The Reds are only a half game back, as I say this. And I know I brought this up last week, and they were like six games out, it seemed. So a half game back of first place. It's not insurmountable, and I get even if the Pirates or the Brewers play pretty well, the Brewers obviously leading that division with the Pirates in third. All three teams are two-and-a-half game difference. I just think that I just think that the Reds might actually have lightning in a bottle right here and be able to win. You have the Cubs four games out, and even the Cardinals in last place, eight out. I don't see those last two teams really making a push. But the Reds are a very real chance to win that division. And then speaking of that division, the Cubs, who I do think should trade, should trade Cody Bellinger to the Rangers and reunite him with his friend and former teammate, Corey Seager. How are you feeling about that one? I honestly, I would love that. I think that's, I think that would be great. I mean, Cubs aren't doing too good. I mean, if they can trade him to the Rangers, you know, get some prospects or something for him and, you know, start building their team up again, I mean, just do it. I mean, definitely the Rangers should be looking to get, you know, someone there to keep it going because, I mean, like the way the Rangers are playing now, they have a good shot to to win that whole division there and, you know, go deep in the playoffs from what it's looking now. So I think if, you know, that would be a fantastic trade, I think, for both sides. I agree. I think that's a move that would be really smart and prudent. And I can see a couple other teams looking for the services of Bellinger. Next, the next one is probably the biggest or section, the second biggest name on this list will be the Milwaukee Brewers trading Corbin Burns to the Arizona Diamondbacks in a massive blockbuster that we all know the D backs can afford to make. Honestly, I think I, I feel like. That probably would get done. I mean, the way things are going, I mean, Brewers just don't seem to have it this year. They're not doing good. I mean, you know, the unloaded Josh Hader last year, you know, and I I would say get it done. I would say if you're the Diamondbacks, I would say do everything you can to get that done because, like, right now, Diamondbacks, they're looking really good this year. They have a good chance of winning that division, too. 
and maybe make it in the playoffs. So, I mean, if they can get it done and they certainly can't afford to get it done, like you said, I mean, you try to get him because that would definitely help them out because I think that's what they're kind of lacking right now, Diamondbacks, is some pitching depth and they're starting rotation. I think they get him. I think they might be set to just stay ahead the whole year and make it to the playoffs. Pitching wins championships, as, as we've heard time and time again. So you can never have too many arms, and especially if you're going to look to add a frontline starter to pair with some of your bigger arms there. Merrill Kelly, Zach Gallen, just some real good players. I think that's a move that they really should look at making. And now for the biggest name on the list, the St. Louis Cardinals should trade Paul Goldschmidt to the Philadelphia Phillies. John, I saved the best for last. Let me hear it. Do you want Goldie to be Reese Hoskins' replacement? Honestly, I wouldn't complain if that trade got, if they, you know, traded for him, but I don't know if I'd like what they'd have to give up to get him. So, you know, I don't know if I'd be willing to give up, you know. What would that be? What do you think they would have to give up? I would think you're looking at maybe Painter or something or maybe some other guy. But I would think, I would almost think Painter's probably gone if that trade's going done. I think you're probably looking at Painter gone or Abel or something like that. And I don't know if I'd be willing to sacrifice some of this pitching coming through the, through the, you know, through the farm system to get Goldschmidt at first base when you already have, I mean, you have like Bowens playing first base, playing it pretty well. And so, so, I mean, what the Phillies have going on is pretty good right now. And you have Derek Hall coming up, but I mean, having Goldschmidt, that would be, you'd have a hell of a team, honestly, if you had him, but I just, I don't know if I'd be willing to give up, you know, like, you know, all the failures and stuff to get him, though. I don't know if I'd be willing to give all the stuff up to get him, though. That's really where the kicker is. Would you be willing to give up what it takes? Because the fit's there. Eight games out of first place, right? You still have the Marlins you need to jump. And then even in the wild card, you're a game back. But you have Cincinnati, San Diego, and the Pirates all, you know, kind of right there. Cincinnati, San Diego also surging. And... Those are teams that you really got to compete with down the long haul. And let's not count out the Mets because I don't think the Mets or the Dodgers, quite frankly, are teams that are dead right now. They both tend to surge in the second half anyway. So the Phillies do need to make a pretty big move to bolster up that team if they want to get back to the World Series. But now, time for John's favorite segment, right, John? Studs and duds. For me, my stud is a Philly. Catcher JT Real Muto, 9-22 over the last week, three home runs, seven RBIs, and he hit for the cycle. That's just a great week. Led all fantasy players over the last week in fantasy points, too. So just an all-around great week. Lucky for anybody that had him on their team because that certainly wasn't me. And my dud, Arizona starting pitcher, Zach Davies. A big reason why they should go get Corbin Burns, right, John? Six and two-thirds of an inning, 0-2 record, 15 hits, 12 earned runs, four walks, six strikeouts, just a bad, bad week for Zach Davies. Now, John, give me your stud and give me your dud. Okay, so for my studs and does this week, I got two pitchers. I got a starting pitcher and I got a relief pitcher. My stud is Josh Hader. He has three saves on the week only given up two hits, and he struck out seven. That's that's a pretty good week, and that's a lot of points for fantasy. And then my dud this week is the Rangers pitch starting pitcher, John Gray, who's like up until now has been absolutely fantastic. I think last week or a week or two ago, he pitched a complete game, but this week he couldn't even make it. He couldn't even make it three innings. He pitched about 2.1 innings, gave up six hits, six earned runs, three walks, only struck out two. But he was able to luckily avoid the loss, but still just a horrendous outing for him and an un, just an uncharacteristic outing for him too. All right, let's keep it rolling. John, our rankings came out, and you had the Dodgers ranked over the Diamondbacks. Care to explain? Yes. Yeah, so, so I think at the time of the make at the time when I uh, made the rankings, I think I wasn't assuming that I think it was before the. San Francisco uh, swept the Dodgers there, so I wasn't able to count that in there. I assume, you know, they would have came back and win it also. And also, and then I had my head of the Diamondbacks was is because, 
you know, the Phillies came back and they basically won that series against them. So, I mean, I thought, you know, the Diamondbacks, I thought the Dodgers weren't going to get swept. And I thought, you know, and Diamondbacks had a rough week. So I put, I had to, I put them ahead there for it. And now let's get into some Phillies talk. You brought them up briefly, but tell me what's going on in the city of brotherly love that I love to hate so much. I think what's going on is they're starting to finally figure it out. You know, I mean, they're starting to gel. They're figuring it out. I mean, they won 13 of their last 15 games. I mean, their pitching rotation has a ERA of 1.74, 93 strikeouts, 22 walks with three home runs in like 88 innings, which is absolutely incredible. I mean, and it's June now, and all of a sudden it's June now. That means Schwarber. JT Ruto and Turner can all of a sudden hit now. You have you have Schwerber has seven home runs, four of which are leadoff home runs in June so far. So he's going off. Then you have JT who has five home runs the last 13 games and also hit for the cycle, like Corey was saying. So he's absolutely like playing amazing. And then Turner's starting to finally come around and starting to hit again. I mean, he's not really, you know, hitting home runs, but he's getting on base. And that's what they were missing. So and then on top of it, and they're they're only they're eight games behind they're eight games out of first place they're behind the Marlins, and I think it's a big surprise the Marlins are playing so good right now and I don't you know I they're playing so good right now and the and the Phillies you know obviously need to get ahead of them like need to get ahead of them and I think this week coming up they play the they play the Braves series and they play the Mets and they play I think the Cubs and the the, the Nationals are the upcoming series they have coming up so. If the Phillies want to really make a shot at take, you know, coming in first and clawing their way back, you know, back into the season and stuff, they need to win those series. They can't lose those series against the Braves and the Mets. They especially need to win they especially need to win the series against the Braves. They can't be losing these series now against these two teams. But it seems like they figured out they're finally pitching good and everything now. I think Sir Anthony Dominguez got hurt. That's gonna hurt. I think he got hurt. That's gonna hurt him a little bit. But the really pitching still going up like Krimble's coming around and everything they're hit. Everyone's hidden and they're hot right now. I think I was reading somewhere that they're actually starting to play in the clubhouse again. They're playing the October playlist, uh, dance with myself after the, after like the last 15 games. So I don't know, maybe they're starting to get channel some of that magic from last year, hopefully, and they'll start winning more games and go on a little run here and get first place. But I mean, in order for that to happen, all the Marlins have to cool off a little bit and so do the Braves. And I don't know if the Braves are going to cool off, but I think the Marlins might cool off in a little bit, might cool off a little bit for enough for the Phillies to maybe jump in second in the East, but I, I'm not sure. It just seems like it's anyone's, it can be anyone's, uh, you know, it's anyone's a uh, chance to win that division there. I mean, even the Mets can come back. So it's a long season left. Yeah, the Phillies are doing better than I expected. And again, still the first half of the season, still before the All-Star break, but it's kind of fun if you're a Phillies fan to see how it's going. You, you, the the moves are live. The clubhouse is vibrant. Things are going and, you know, doesn't hurt that you don't really look at the Marlins as a viable, you know, enemy. They're not going to stand in your way. And as long as you think you can beat the Braves when it comes down to it, that's all that matters into getting back to the World Series for the for the Phillies because the Braves are really the, the team to beat in the National League. Now, speaking of teams to beat, are the Angels one of them? Do we believe that this 11-4 and run I mentioned earlier, do we believe that the Angels are a playoff-caliber team? Yes, they have Trout. Yes, they have Otani. But they've had Trout and Otani together since 2018 and Trout since 2012. That doesn't mean anything. What's different now? Because this isn't Trout's best season. And quite frankly, I don't even think this is Otani's best season we've seen. He's just playing more consistently. So what's the reason for this? And do we do you trust it, really? I'm not even sure what to think of this. Because, I mean, every year you want to give them the benefit of the doubt and rank them high and, you know, have them as a playoff contender with the players they have. Because, I mean, honestly, with – you know, Trout and Otani, I mean, they should be in talks to make the playoffs every single year with the two of them. I mean, they're like two MVP caliber players and some of the best, you know, players to ever play at the game. But I just don't know if the players around them are, you know, really, I don't know if they have a really good supporting cast around them per se. 
So, I mean, right now they're hot. I don't know if they can keep it up. I mean, you want to say it's a real and you want to say that they're going to keep this up and, you know, get in the first place and, you know, stay up there and making the playoffs and stuff. But I just, you know, every year you, I feel like if we fall for it every year, they just disappoint. I'm just, I'm not really sure. I'm going to do something I haven't done in a while. I'm going to believe in the Angels. I think this might be it. I think that Angels ownership will do anything they can at the deadline to make some moves because they want Otani to stay. Art Moreno wants Otani to stay. I know I know they had some talks and some thoughts about selling the team, but that was squashed. They're here to stay, that front office, that ownership. If they can show Shohei that they have a winning roster, why not stay? He chose the Angels. He wants to win. Now, if you can give him a massive deal on top of it, which the Angels have been known to do, giving Trout and Rendon big contracts, why wouldn't Otani stay? So I think they're going to do everything they can, and I think they will get into the playoffs. Maybe make a little noise, because it's all about getting Otani to stay with them. Now, in 2022, the Yankees, when they got their 33rd loss of the season, had 69 wins. The Astros had 64. The Dodgers, 79. That's a lot of wins. But in 2023, all three teams are 39 and 33. A 30 to 40 game drop in the win column by that 33rd win. What's going on with these three perennial powerhouse teams that going into the season, they were one, two, and three in the uh, World Series favorite rankings? I mean, honestly, well, I think with the Yankees is they're in a really tough division. Like, they're, like AL East is probably the strongest division in baseball, and I think that's factoring in with that there. And they have injuries. I mean, I don't think it's a you know anything you know time to hit the panic button or anything. It's a you know long season, and even though you know they go on some you know cold streaks, hot streaks, I still think they're there. And you know, with the Astros and Dodgers, I think it's you know more or less like kind of the same thing. I think you know there's some teams who were previously in you know years who weren't as good that are now good again. And I'm almost thinking that it's the way they're doing the schedules this year, where you have a lot of teams playing teams they don't usually play. So it's like you know they, these teams can't sit there and beat up on the lower teams in their division. You know, you know week in and week out, and they're starting to have to play like you know better teams that they don't usually play or maybe see a lot. And I think maybe that might factor in why there's some of these bad teams who are bad for so long are, play, are doing good again because they're playing against teams they don't normally see. But, I mean, obviously big things, injuries too. And then you get the normal hot and cold, you know, ebb and flow of the season, you know, stuff. I feel like there's very few teams every season that can keep up like a high pace of play, kind of like the, the Rays are doing right now and stuff where they just seems like they just keep winning and winning and winning. And even when they go on like a cold streak, they still – they they, you know, kind of bounce back and win, win, win. So I think it's a hard thing to do to keep that up all season. I mean, I wouldn't worry too much about any of these teams yet because they're still, you know, they're still up there. They're still in play, you know. It's just they they can't let it go on for too long. It's just a sad situation all around. The Yankees have so many holes, so many issues. The only bright side is their bullpen has been the best in baseball all season. And even that I don't think is going to stay. They're going to be they're gonna be buyers at the deadline because that's just who the Yankees are. But there's a re very real chance that by the end of next week, by the All-Star break, mostly sooner, the Yankees will be in last place in their division. I can't tell you when the last time the Yankees were in last place in their division going into All-Star weekend. It's something almost unheard of in modern memory, especially in the last 40 years, really. The Dodgers, I don't even know what their issue is. I know losing Gavin Lux in spring training hurt them because they're not really getting great production at shortstop, but Mookie Betts is healthy. Clayton Kershaw is pitching very well. Freddie Freeman was hot, hot, hot in May. So I they, are they just a mediocre team? I know they're not getting the production they wanted out of Walker Bueller. I mean, Luis Urias, just guys aren't playing well, and it's just sad to see the Astros. McCullers out for the year. Gar Luis Garcia is out for the year. Jordan's out for an extended period of time. It's just injuries upon injuries upon injuries for baseball's best. But let's go into the weekly series highlight. John, what's one series that you're looking to highlight this week? 
one series I'm looking to highlight I'm actually and I'm actually very excited for is Baltimore at Tampa Bay. You got the you know you got first place and second place AL East teams right there. You know you have you have the Rays who are just playing out of their minds this year, and I think just way better than anyone could have expected or even predicted them playing. And you even have the Orioles playing way better than I think anyone's expected them to play. And it'll just be a good matchup to see. And I think, you know, kind of almost, I, you know, I don't know if you want to, I don't know if some people are ready to say like the Orioles are for real this, this year, but I mean, it's kind of another test to see, you know, how good the Orioles are and if they can, you know, hold their own against this, you know, dominant raised team. Yeah. For me, I'm choosing the San Diego Padres at the San Francisco Giants. This is their first matchup since that Mexico City series where things were lighting up a little bit. Lots of balls flying, high scoring games, sports books shutting off sports betting home runs on that because they're greedy and hate their hate their uh, clients. The Giants currently on a seven game win streak. San Diego's won seven of their last ten. Is Fernando Tatis Jr. has been on fire since the beginning of June raising his OPS by close to 200 points. This is just going to be a really great matchup. Both teams surging. And quite frankly, these are the two teams that might be challenging the Diamondbacks come September for the division if the D-backs can't put some more games in between. So it's going to be a really fun series to watch. A couple other ones I just want to note. Atlanta plays the Phillies in division matchup. Really big deal, as you know that, John. The Dodgers... They play the Angels, Crosstown Rivals. Again, big series. We talked Subway Series last week. The Yankees and Mets split that. Luckily, I was at the game that the Yankees ended up winning. So, you know, good for me because I could not imagine watching the Mets win that one. That would have been a heartbreaker. And also, the Rangers go to the Yankees. The Yankees in the past have played pretty well against the Rangers. The Yankees were the Rangers' opponent when Jacob deGrom went down and out for the season. So it's a pretty big matchup. The Yankees really need to finish their slide. Mariners, the beginning of the week, Rangers at the end. They got to figure out something. They can't keep losing games. But let's leave it on that note because all the Yankees, Mets, Dodgers, and Astros do are lose games. Keep checking out the socials, outsidersports.net for the rankings and other great stuff going on all around the Outsider Sports community. Outsider Sports 3 is the Twitter. Search us up, YouTube and TikTok. Just search up Outsider Sports. You'll find us there. Keep tuning in week to week. We'll be back next week. Maybe do a little bit of All-Star Game preview.